Everybody, welcome to another live stream where I'm answering DNA tests and genealogy questions. Um, starting a little bit later than usual. I know usually I start at around 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. It's 2.30, but just <laughs> running a little bit late today. So it is what it is. But thank you, everybody, for joining. I um, hope you all had a uh, wonderful holiday. hope you all are going to have a wonderful new year. Uh, gonna click through a couple hellos. So if you haven't said hello yet, say hello and where you're from. Um, Michael Clark's here from London. Up, oh, Miss Karma. Hello, Karma. Welcome again from Nebraska. Very cold there, I guess. Yeah. Um, hello from San Diego. We've got Alexandra from Germany. Manny's here. Welcome. We've got Canada in the building. We have uh, Peter Heiger, uh watching from the. Hanseatic League City Bjorn Bjorgvin Bergen Norway did I, I don't know if I pronounced that right let me know did I uh but hello hello Charlie as always the wonderful Charlie uh hello Jackie from the uh the Caribbean we've got Karen from North London we have Canadian Spring from Ontario so all right we've got lots and lots of rep uh representation around the world in here today um looks like we're starting out a little bit later than usual with uh, the numbers, but hopefully we'll have some more people joining. Um, if you haven't yet, please be sure to like, subscribe, follow, whatever. Um, so depending if you're on Twitch or whatever, uh, it all helps me out. Um, but today, let's get this pulled up. Not the entire screen. Uh, I think this is what I want. I think that's what I want. There we go. Yeah, that's what that's what we wanted. So we'll be answering questions today. Um, as usual, um, if you have questions, be sure to post them in the chat. I'll try to get to questions, but I can't guarantee that I will. The only questions in chat that I guarantee that I will answer are the ones that are the super stickers or whatever. Um, which that also does help support the channel. But then if you do have a question that you really want me to answer that'll guarantee that I answer it on the stream. Um, but otherwise, the way we're going to do this today, we're going to be going through the top of this month. 
And uh, you probably noticed that I had titled this a bit more specifically as third-party DNA websites and uh, haplogroups. And that was because I went through these. You can see that some of them I've clicked through just to kind of see what the questions were. And there were a lot of third-party stuff. Uh, Genome Link, I think, came up twice or three times along with Tell Me Gen. And then there was a mitochondrial question. But I was also thinking what we might do is I didn't even think to look at the top ones throughout the year. So we may look at a few of the top ones throughout the year. And then we'll probably at some point just go to the oldest ones so, just so we can clear up some of the really, really old ones. Um, yeah, what was I doing? This month. Okay, so before I jump into that, let me just make sure that I'm caught up on this stuff. Ah, Maven, someone that I read their posts in the last video messaged you on Family Search. Very cool. Very cool. I, I know one thing I probably need to be better at is somehow linking somewhere the questions that I answer to the stream. So actually, maybe that's what I'll do today is every time I finish one, I'll post this stream link as a comment and say your answer or your question was answered in this stream. I should have been doing that for a while. I can't believe I just, wow. Wow, people, wow. Well, <laughs> I guess you can't have all the good ideas at once, huh? So let's see if I can, um, I'm going to see if I can edit the screen a bit just so that we can, so that it's a little bit more legible. Let's make it smaller. <laughs> Actually, I think I can do it by editing this. There we go. So that should hopefully, that should make it a little bit easier. And then save new layout. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. What do you all think? Um, all right. So let's uh, let's just jump into the first question. Um, oh, actually, before we do, Genie Vlogger, end of year survey, just a few days left to, to do that. So if you haven't done it yet, be sure to go and do that. So, so here we go. I'm Ghanaian and Nigerian and also been told my great-grandmother had either Fulani or Tuareg roots. Um, not sure if I pronounced that right. There were no comments. I didn't see any thing else but they did post three images all from genome link which i'm not really familiar with how um accurate genome link is part of it being that there's no white paper to see recall and precision numbers and i looked for one the only thing i found was someone commenting three years ago that the owner of genome link sent them a white paper directly but i just find it out you know why not just have it available so I think the question basically is, is, you know, I'm the Ghanaian and Nigerian and also have these things. Why are my results showing up as they are? And I mean, for one, the only site I know that really does nuanced African readings, which I guess Genome Link really goes for a much more nuanced uh, reading than what you get with Ancestry. But uh, the one that I know that does that is Living DNA. How accurate that is, I also don't know because I don't think Living DNA <laughs> releases a white paper with that information. So with, with Genome Link, the one thing I am noticing is that it seems to be giving this... Okay, so I guess we're getting different results. Overall ethnicities... Okay, so this is the top. This is the, the bottom of the list. So West African, Niger to Congo, it's showing these... These are the tribes, so not not like country regions or things like that, which is a big point that a lot of people go at when they talk about how can your readings be, you know, considered worthwhile when they're going by modern day country lines that were defined by European colonizing countries, uh, as opposed to the actual tribal areas, which would make more sense genetically because that's from my understanding, that would be the way to tell the population groups and their closeness is the tribes versus the modern day countries. Um, so it seems like that's what they're going for is giving that sort of a reading of these are the tribes from those areas. Um, although I guess some of them are kind of more just of a regional thing, but you can see how it's cut, you know, jumping from different countries into different countries. And like over here where you have, you know, Benin and Togo and, 
you know, all of these different in Ghana and all these places, it's not adhering to the actual country lines. Um, so, I mean, nothing that I can really answer for them. I mean, they say Ghanaian and Nigerian, which I mean, they're kind of, you know, they're getting certainly, I mean, I, it covers those areas for the most part, not all of it, obviously, but you know, it's getting into those areas. So yeah, Fulani and Tureg, I'm not sure where the Fulani were. Um, I guess I could just Google it. Uh, so, okay, so same area. So Hassa, Fulani, Yoruba, Igbo. So all kind of right here. And of course, looking, where's that map right here? So we can see it's kind of jumping in, but it's not covering the entire country, but we can kind of see how that's broken up. So yeah, I, I think that's what the question is. Not a hundred percent sure. Um, but interesting to see these results. The big thing with it for me is what's, what's the deal with the white paper for genome link? Because that would be the way to tell the accuracy. Uh, but I would be very interested to see someone do living DNA and then someone do um, genome link and then compare those results. Uh, someone with African ancestry specifically so that we can compare those results because these are two companies that are giving much more nuanced readings than a lot of the major companies. And that's probably because the major companies don't feel comfortable don't feel confident enough to give readings like that. Um, so, all right. I think, I think I've answered this one. We'll mark that as reviewed. And then let's see, do I have, yeah. Is this the, let me, let me make sure this is the actual link to the live. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah. P two. Okay. Answered in this live stream. Answered in this live stream. Okay. And actually, I'll just go ahead and copy that. So, all right. And just, just to say real quickly for those who uh, aren't familiar with kind of one of the processes that I'm starting now with the Reddit questions is I'm going by the top. So those that have the most upvotes. So when you go on to the Reddit, if you see questions that you think should be answered, either it's something you really want answered or you think it'd be a good question to be answered or something interesting, upvote it. And then every time I do one of these, the ones with the, the most upvotes will be answered most recently. Um, yeah, so... I'm not going to do all from this month because there weren't that many posted this month as opposed to this year. So we'll focus mostly on this year, but a few of these we'll, we'll get into. So let me check, uh, let me check chat, <laughs> see, catch up with everything. Um, oh yes. Thank you. Don't forget to like the stream. If you have not yet, uh, if you're on Twitch, if you're on Facebook, uh, if you're on, uh, YouTube, there's all sorts of ways to do it. And also if you are on Twitch, but you're watching on a different platform, I'm trying to build my Twitch up. So if you can go to Twitch, uh, comment in there, say hello, follow all of that. Greatly appreciate it. Um, so, all right, let's keep going. Uh, ah, Stephen Molsap is here. Welcome, Stephen. Always wonderful to have you in the stream. Thank you. I hope, uh, hope you the best in the new year as well. Um, Oh, adverts in the live stream. Interesting. I haven't been sure how the whole adverts works. I thought it gives you an advertisement right when it starts. So, um, let's see, that's living DNA right there. It's pretty good. Oh, that was living DNA that I was looking at. Okay. So I thought that was all genome linked. So let's, let's go back then. So that's living DNA. Interesting. Yeah. See, I, I don't really use living DNA. It's not very helpful for me. So, okay. Interesting. Interesting. And then they're getting that East African over there into, into Egypt. And then they're getting a little bit of that North African. Oh, and there's just, just a little bit hiding over here. <laughs> just a little bit. hiding. Um, all right. So I'm going to close that out and then tell me, Jen, Uploaded ancestry thoughts, West German with great grandfather from Russian and German great grandmother from Pomerania, present day Poland. 
What's interesting, I got Hungarian Iberian on family tree DNA too, but not on ancestry 23 me living DNA and not my heritage. Uh, all right, so what's also interesting, it's the first test where I don't score any German. I get Netherlands on my heritage, but on 23andMe, I get Belgium on 23andMe. Okay, so let's see what we're looking at. Okay, what site is this? <laughs> this is, it says Ancestry, but I've never seen Ancestry results look like this. Granted, I, I've never really used the Ancestry app much, but this looks like, I mean, this, this doesn't look like any of the sites. Does anyone know what this is? Um, oh, tell, oh, that's right. Tell me, Jen, I'm asking what it is and it says it in the, so, so they're asking about this stuff, but they're just providing tell me, Jen, they're not providing me any of the other ones. So I guess this is what tell me, Jen looks like. Um, so there's, so that's the overall thing. British colonies, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Iberian Peninsula. Okay. Then where's this? Okay. Eastern Europe, 21.1%. And then they break it down Poland and Hungary. Interesting. So they're actually, they're saying we're detecting Poland and Hungary, which I guess you know, usually when you see that stuff, the community type of stuff, that means that they have DNA matching or they're getting people's actual family trees that say where they're from. Or I guess they wouldn't necessarily need that. They could just have a question of where are your grandparents from or where were they born, uh, which may be where that's coming from. But yeah, I mean, this would really be, let's see. Tell me, Jen, uh, white paper. Do they have a white paper? Who we are. some lame explanation video that probably just explains it in the most basic way that really doesn't tell you anything. Okay, so everything's on this page. Tell me, Jen. Tell me, Jen. Yeah. Um, if anyone knows about a white paper for them, let me know. But I, I, I do not see one. So I'm guessing that they don't have one. So... Once again, a question of, you know, reliability. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's some of these bigger websites don't release white papers as well. So, you know, MyHeritage, they don't have a white paper. But they do have, I think, enough time with their genetic relatives results that even though a lot of people kind of really hate their admixture stuff and they don't really have a white paper, the genetic relatives and tools that they provide have been proven through actual research to work. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, I'm not, I mean, it, once again, one of these admixture questions where there's really not much to answer, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I don't really know enough about this test. I obviously am not seeing these results, so I can't really tell you, you know, and they say, they say some things that are weird. I got Hungarian and Iberian on family tree DNA, I didn't know that family tree DNA had a specific Hungarian population group. It, it certainly may be that way. I mean, they're, they they updated a lot, but someone knows a uh, comment. Um, but then they say, but not on ancestry 23. I mean, living, but then again, the question is, okay, well, even if they are defining a Hungarian on family tree DNA, are they defining that on the other ones? Cause more than likely Hungarian is just falling into a broadly Eastern European or broadly Balkan, or some sort of mixture of both, in a sense. Um, and so it's just, it, yeah, there's really not much to answer here. 
So let's just go ahead and re <laughs> review. Answered the live stream. Answered. Not really answered, unfortunately. I mean, there's really just, yeah. I think I've said I've said it too many times already. So let's continue. Um, okay, so this one I did want to answer. These next two I did want to answer, and then I think I'll jump to the year one just because the month one we really really didn't have that many. Um, let me okay. Let me check up the comments. So let's see. Um, Thank you, Charlie. Please join the Discord server if you haven't already, everybody. Uh, that's the, the link. D our Discord server is actually pretty active. A lot of people helping each other uh, with DNA and genetic genealogy and a lot of very, uh, very knowledgeable people and a lot of people in there that don't give themselves enough credit and how, much, how knowledgeable that they are. Um, a few that I would define as at least expert or at least, but a, a few people in there that I would define as expert uh, researchers that kind of define themselves as intermediate or even beginner. I'm like, yeah, no, you're you're better than you think. Um, okay, so did that say it is only twenty dollars? I get, I don't know. It's probably a twenty dollar upload sort of thing. I don't know if they actually test. Tell me, Jen. Or... So, I don't know. Wow, they sell a lot. Pack with three advanced DNA kits. Duo advanced. Children advanced. Advanced. Ah, so the advanced gives you the health. Okay, yeah. All right. So, might have... Uh, oh, wait, no, let me just double check... Uh, yeah, Family Tree DNA has a Magyar category. Yeah, that one I always found. Ah, I did not realize that. I did not realize that would uh, equate to Hungarian. I always knew it was kind of that general area, but I never really looked that in depth into that. Just because, you know, the admixtures really aren't that important to me. Um, you know, it's the genetic relatives. It's the genetic matching. So, okay, mitochondrial DNA haplogroup. Dear Genie Vlogger, I have a question. Maternal and paternal grandmothers have different mitochondrial DNA haplogroup. Of course. What mitochondrial DNA haplogroup will their granddaughter get from her mother? Well, the mother will get the haplogroup that her mother had, which then the granddaughter will get that. So the granddaughter will have the same mitochondrial haplogroup as the maternal grandmother. Um, so let's see, uh, the granddaughter will get the same mitochondrial. DNA. Yeah. Since mitochondrial is have, blah, blah, blah. Uh, is it worth testing my mother to get a better picture of what came from her side? Um, so the, the question here, uh, is it worth testing my mother to get a better picture of what came from her side? The question I would have is, are you asking about having her do a mitochondrial DNA test or an autosomal DNA test? Because if you're just looking to have her do a mitochondrial DNA test, you're probably not going to get that much. It's not going to be that worthwhile if you already have her maternal granddaughter who has the same haplogroup having done a mitochondrial DNA test. Now, if the answer is an autosomal test, the answer would be yes, and very worthwhile to have her test, which is basically kind of the answer that they give here of, you know, yes, your mother has double the amount of DNA from her side on the autosomal part. Testing her will help you get a, a better picture of her side. Whereas with mitochondrial DNA, you're getting the full thing from your mother. You're not getting any mitochondrial DNA from your paternal line, except for in like really, really, really rare genetic cases, which I know people have asked me about those over the years, but it's one of those things where it's, it's so rare that it's not really something that most people need to worry about. Um, so yes, I've got, I've just got an ancestry kit. I will test my mother first. Thank you for being so helpful. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then we have there's something about an X chrome. Oh yeah. Thank you for your reply. The second X chromosome is from my paternal grandmother, right? Um, I guess it depends when she says her where I don't know where she is in the family tree. Does it bring any ethnic information on my father's side? My father died and I don't keep in touch with his. Oh, so if she tests, she tests. So yeah, so 
Uh, necessary parking. Remember that xDNA and mitochondrial DNA are different things. The granddaughter, assuming this is you, that's that's the thing is she hasn't said it, so we have to make an assumption here. So it's good she's our, our necessary parking is indicating that uh, the granddaughter will inherit xDNA from the paternal grandmother since females require two X chromosomes, one from each parent. If you are a male, you would only inherit xDNA from your mother's side. And so this is a big thing in genetic genealogy, X chromosome inheritance. There are X chromosome inheritance charts that you can look up. And the way that those work is if you do a DNA test, you match someone with a significant amount of X chromosome DNA, then you can kind of dwindle it down to what lines would you have received that X chromosome from? Because as a male, you can completely rule out your paternal line because you're not getting any paternal X chromosome DNA. So that's what they're saying here. And they kind of go into more information in terms of the ethnic information. I would recommend testing with Ancestry DNA. Yeah, I don't know if any of the sites that do testing on X chromosome, if they use the X chromosome in um, ancestral, uh, in the ancestry, uh, at, blah, 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 can't talk. The ethnicity add an extra results. Um, so yeah, so this one pretty quick answer, just literally straightforward. Maternal grandmother is going to have the same haplogroup as the granddaughter uh so all right so let's put that in here comment let's tag this viewed and let's check the the chat see see what it's come um 23 me also gave my dad the maternal haplogroup and he shares it with someone in history uh my closest match that may be mom's side is around 40 centimorgans my closest match that maybe mom's side is around 40 cents of organs would be there. Would there be much value in testing my mom? Yes, definitely. Because when it comes to DNA recombination, it's random. So even though you're getting 50% of your DNA from your mom, if this cousin is um, whatever side you're related to this person through that you're getting the 40 cents of organs, you may have only received a very small amount of that DNA from your mom. So when your mom tests, she could end up matching this person at like 150 centimorgans or, you know, even more. And, you know, I've seen a lot of cases where you have one generation that gets a really big amount. And then the next generation you see are matching very small just because they just didn't inherit that much DNA from that connection. So having your mom test would be a huge thing in an end actuality, uh, not only in investigative genetic genealogy, but also just in regular um, adoptee cases and search angel cases. If we have a parent or an older generation that we can get tested, that's something that we can do and that will help greatly. So for investigative genetic genealogy cases, a common technique we would use is if we had a really good match and we were trying to build out the tree and figure out which side of their tree the match was from, but we couldn't, but we found out that this match, their parents were alive or the grandparents were alive or something like that. A suggestion we would give to law enforcement is reach out to this DNA match or their parents and see are the parents or the grandparents, whoever willing to do a DNA test because that could tell us so much more. For one, it tells you which side it's from. So you say here, maybe from mom's side, but if she tests and it doesn't match your mom's side, well, now you have confirmation that it's on your dad's side. Uh, and then, of course, the other way is if you do test your mom and then it comes back as a match, you get a much better idea of how close that match is. So if your mom tests and she ends up getting 40 cent a Morgan match just like you, then that kind of gives you more confidence in the fact that it's a much more distant match. If your mom tests and then she ends up getting much more DNA than you, you're going to have a much better idea. Well, for one, you'll know they're closer uh, or, and you'll have a much better idea of how close because 40 cent Morgan match, you have a lot of possibilities as opposed of, of how that relation is versus 140. So <clears throat> looking at the shared cent Morgan project, we put in 40, look at how many possibilities there are of where they could be within your family tree. And then we go in and we add 140 to it. And it's still a lot of possibilities, but it cuts it down by a lot. And even more, you have a kind of stronger correlation with a fewer amount of, of, of possibilities. So just going back to this 40 again, 
notice how all of a sudden you, you have a lot of these and in the 48%, you have a ton falling in there. Whereas with that 140, there's really only four that are really high up three that are, you know, they're all possible, but you ha you get a much stronger correlation of what you're probably looking at. Um, and even better, you know, you could have a 40 cents Morgan match and then your mom tests and all of a sudden it comes back as a 200 cents a Morgan match. And now you've got an even better idea. Um, and then on top of that, with your mom doing a DNA test, she, if she ends up getting more DNA shared with this person than you, that also means that she may get matches from the same side that you didn't even get because she's sharing so much more DNA or she has more DNA from that line of the family that you didn't have. So those matches weren't coming up, but now that she's tested, these matches are coming up because they do have that DNA that she shares that you didn't inherit. And now you may find more matches that you didn't even know were there that may still be distant. You know, you might find a couple more 50 or 60 centimorgans or things like that, but each one that you add in helps you determine and decipher where in their family tree it might fit. And it also helps just too in your close relatives, you'll get a better idea with how your mom's matching them. And that can also help in looking at your shared matches. So there's just so many ways that having your mom test will be helpful. So hopefully that was helpful for you, that, that, that answer. Um, okay, so uh, I wonder if I should answer this one was there much here genome links european report compared to ancestry dna so I, I i don't think there's a oh the event trooper very the event trooper someone uh who who's in our discord who has post been posting a lot um although proof that D what <laughs> why are you saying that dna tests aren't a lie um but yeah okay that's that's kind of funny <laughs> all right um, so here we have genome link giving a breakdown, Iberian, South Slavic, Southern Italy, Great Britain, Northern Europe, Irish, German. So their, their results are a little bit nuanced. Um, here we have, I guess the second part of it. So these are the below 3.1 Roma, South Balkan, French, Hispanic Jews, Seriously, what would are those supposed to be Sephardic Jews or are those supposed to be Jews that I, I don't know? <laughs> I mean, I guess I would assume that's Sephardic Jews because, yeah, all right. Um, and then let's see. Oh, and then they have even more. And is that it? Okay, and here we have the ancestry. Sweden, Denmark, Scotland, Ireland, Germanic Europe, Baltics, North, very, very typical Northwestern European readings, basically like all of the, all of the marks that you would kind of expect the Swedish, Denmark, Scotland, Ireland, Germanic Europe, Baltics, Norway, England, Northwestern Europe. I think the one that probably doesn't fit as well, but still kind of does Baltics. Um, but Baltics is one of those ones that I wouldn't say is super common in Northwestern European, but it's not that uncommon either um it, but definitely lower on the list of what you'd necessarily expect but all kind of the typical ones and then we look here it's just i mean it's kind of all over the place the iberian um i mean that yeah south slavic too which i mean south slavic maybe that Maybe you could consider Baltics and Germanic Europe as part of that. Uh, Southern Italy. Yeah, I mean, this just once again, what's the white paper say? Because this is so nuanced with so many small readings of different things like French, Hispanic. Jews. Like it just, it, 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 it's very odd. Very, very odd. And the worst part is, is that for a lot of people trying to figure out their ancestry that are obsessed with admixture results because they think that they're going to find one that's going to all of a sudden be this like answer that's going to open up the stories. But it really, it makes it, it makes your ancestry more confusing than anything, unless you already didn't really know much about your ancestry. But the more that you do, the more confused you'll be because every single test is going to be slightly different. 
because the true strength are the genetic matches, um, at least in terms of the ancestral part of these DNA tests. Obviously, the health and traits and all that does have its own use. Um, but yeah, let's see. Let's see what comments say other than the event trooper. I don't know. I will say Ryan's Reddit account OP. Well, no DNA test is going to be perfect, but Genome Link is one of the least accurate DNA tests I've done so far. I don't even know how they're coming up with Iberian and Southern Italian. At least they recognize that I have English, Scottish, Irish, German, and Danish ancestry. So I'll give Genome Link some points there. But yeah, I mean, OP is spot on with that. None of them are going to be perfect for the admixture part. But, you know, when it comes to ones where it's just way off from what you do know about your tree, then that's where you start to question it most, especially when there's no white paper to correlate the results to see those precision and recall numbers. And I, I think most everybody in my stream is is very familiar with me talking about uh, precision and recall. But just for those that maybe aren't familiar with it, let me just show you what precision and recall is. So uh, for those that aren't familiar with this, by the way, if you go to 23andMe, I always just Google it, but this link here, they have publications and go to their white papers page. And then for their white papers, they have white papers for all the different parts of their, their test. I don't know if it's necessarily every single part, um, but what we want is ancestry composition. And in here, they're telling us, the white paper is telling us how they're coming up with it. The, 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 in their, you know, they start with an introduction. You can see all of these different studies that they're citing. So if you really want to learn, how are they actually coming up with this? Because it's very complicated. You can go in and read it. And then their methods and all sorts of other parts of it. But for us, just the, the parts that kind of help make it understandable are the precision and recall. We also have this part here, reference population sample composition. So you can see how many people are actually making up that sample? And even more, what does 23andMe have specifically that they aren't getting from the public? And then what's that total? So like Ashkenazi Jewish, they have a 1,007 person reference population sample that only they use. So the Ashkenazi Jewish readings that you're going to get in 23andMe may seem very different from the other ones because the population uh, sample that they're using is only one that they have, at least that you know from what they indicate. Whereas here with Bengal and Northeast India, they do have a good amount that are just in their system, but then they have 80 coming from the public. Um, so let me just check up on chat real quick because I think it's been a second. Oh yeah, we had a few people coming in. Hello, yes, better better late than never. Hello, hello. Um, Let's see what is your take on nebula's ancestry readings is it accurate or based on the size of database they have like the other dna what sites so you're talking about nebula's whole genome sequence which i actually i don't think i realized that they had uh a ancestry admixture thing um i'll have to i'll have to look at that maybe i'll pull up my results uh for us to look at in a bit for nebula um, cause I didn't know they were doing that. Uh, let's see, just kind of reading through these quick ones. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello. Another common name that I see a lot in the uh, streams and comments. Um, my heritage shows me a lot of Finnish relatives and there's a strong presence of Mesoamerican and Andean ancient Siberian connection. Uh, yeah, interesting. I don't know. I think I've heard people talk about this connection with the Finnish and, and uh, uh, indigenous American, um, but I'm not super familiar with that. Uh, okay, let's see. We've got a lot of stuff. Um, uh, congratulations, breaking down the brick wall. Hello from Vancouver. We got some more Canadians in here. It's a recent addition for Nebula. Okay, so yeah, maybe uh, we'll, we'll look at that together uh, on the stream. So you'll get to see 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 my results with me. We'll get to react. So back to back to what I was talking about here with the results. So this is the white paper, and this is how we can tell how things are are the confidence of each population group. So we do have the numbers, which is helpful, just in I in my sense of understanding why you might get readings very different on 23andMe versus another site because 
you see that there's a big difference, you go and you look at the white paper and you see, oh yeah, they're using a population reference that they claim that only they have. So obviously there's going to be slight difference from them and ancestry with that. But the big thing is the precision and recall. And the precision and recall is basically telling us how strong it's reading them in two different ways. So um, let's see, maybe because it's always easier to kind of show it like show, show one of these things. So, okay. So there's two different ways to look at it. And yeah, we're, we'll just look from here. So we have we have our precision, which is how many retrieved items are out of the, the total that we would expect. So basically, the this big circle, these are all the positives. This is what we should be getting. And then everything out here is different. So precision is basically asking, out of all of the positives, how many are actually being read as truly that? So when we go back to here with the precision, for Sub-Saharan African, for people that all know they have Sub-Saharan African, 99% of them are being read. Then going back here for recall, how many relevant items are retrieved? So really, out of all of the positives, how many were true positives? So if we look on this side here, we have all of these true positives, and then we have all of these false negatives. So basically, recall is telling us out of all of these that should be what is actually being, or I hope I'm explaining this well, because it's always kind of confused. <laughs> Let's see if it, this one's a little bit better. So yeah, so true positives, precision would be true positives over true positives plus false positives, basically the, the what should be positive. Um, so how many of the total that should be positive are being read and then of recall how many that are being called positive are actually positive um so looking at the numbers we can see on the the overall areas which i guess i don't want to say continental because it's obviously regional continent but sub-saharan africa we can see the readings are very high 99 98.6 99.2 98.2 then when it gets more regional, you can see the numbers start kind of going down a bit and they're still all staying very, very high up there. So we can be pretty confident about West African readings, um, you know, maybe Sierra Leone, Liberia, um, Ivory Coast and Ghana, not quite as much because we see in the recalls that they are getting a lot of, there, there's a lot that they're saying are positive that are actually negative. So for all the people that do have this ancestry, it's very strong in picking that up, but it's also picking up, it's giving it to a lot of people that don't have that ancestry. Um, but then let's see if we can find one that's much lower altogether. Okay, so like here, Mongolia and Manchuria, all of a sudden we're getting readings like this. So of all the people that have Mongolian and Manchurian ancestry, only 38.1% actually were read. Whereas of all of the people that got Mongolian and Manchurian, it was 91.6%. So that tells us that the people that are getting Mongolian and Manchurian readings do have a high possibility that they truly do have that. But for people that do have Mongolian and Manchurian, it's not uncommon to not get any of those readings. So this is how you use that. So if you had Mongolian ancestry and you do a test, and you don't get any of it. You go and look at this and you go, ah, so they aren't that great with picking it up for everybody. But on the opposite side of the coin, if you didn't know you had Mongolian and Manchurian and you get a reading and you go and look at this, you go, okay, well, it does have a decent confidence for all the people that they are giving this reading. They do truly have that ancestry. So maybe I'm a bit more confident that way. So that's how you use these is, is to really figure out what the confidence is with each population group in that admixture. So if you get something that's out of the ordinary or you're not getting something that you're expecting, this is how you can tell how confident can you be in that reading either not being there or that reading being there. Um, you know, so like going down here, Central Asian, if you didn't know you had any Central Asian ancestry and you got Central Asian reading from 23andMe, 
Well, 49.4% of the people that got that reading didn't have Central Asian ancestry. So the confidence is pretty low that you truly have Central Asian. Um, whereas for people that did have Central Asian ancestry, 86% of them were getting that reading. So if you do have true Central Asian ancestry, you have a bit higher confidence that you should get it picked up on 23andMe. Um, so this is the importance of the white papers. Uh, it, honestly, it's just a small portion of the importance of the white papers because the white papers also give us all of the other pieces of the, the um, references that they're using, the studies that are used, the way that they do it. Um, but yeah, okay, let's, uh, let's check up on chats. Um, Let's see. Ba, ba, ba. Okay. Ah, interesting. I think genome link gives more ancient results. That could that could be the case. Is that they're they're giving it more of a you know what you're connecting to based on ancient studies. I don't know that much in depth about genome link, and I think I say this all the time, but I really don't know that much about a lot of the third party sites because if they don't have anything that's genealogically useful. I don't really care that much about it. It's just not that, you know, for me, I'm trying to find the DNA stuff that helps me break through and build trees and actually learn hidden pieces of ancestry. So um, what I am going to do, I'm going to pull up my nebula so we can look at, um, oh, what's it doing? So we can look at this uh, <laughs> admixture result that uh, someone was claiming they now have, which I did not realize. So, okay. Ah. I have to, <laughs> it's making me enable two factor authentications. Everybody, everybody hold up. Everybody hold up. Oh. A lot of stuff I got to figure out with this. <laughs> so. Okay, so I'm like trying to, I, it's been a while since I've logged into it, so I need to actually get the login information. Um, ba, 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 ba. Sent it here. No, where did I do it? Okay, maybe I sent it over here. <laughs> All right. Let's see, is there a site to put unidentified family photos on? No, and that was actually something. Well, actually, maybe there, maybe there are. I don't know for sure. Um, you know, there, I've been working with some different people to try to develop some facial recognition stuff. Um, uh, specifically Scott Genzer has been super helpful for me. If everyone's not, for those unfamiliar with Scott, uh, I, I interviewed him in my video about the future of genealogy and we sp specifically discussed, uh, facial recognition. And so, um, he goes in depth into a lot of that and he created kind of his own site that he uses for specific projects, but, um, I don't know of any specific sites that do that. So, okay, let's see. Uh, 
Ah. All right, I might have to do this later. This is uh, this is taking me a lot longer to find than I thought it would. Ah, thank you everyone for holding strong with me while I'm figuring this out. Um, it's got to be somewhere. Um, all right, let's see. Maybe I can do this without. All right. I think I can do this without it. All right. <laughs> let's see. So... Added user to Ancestry queue. Okay, interesting. So I guess Yeah. Huh. All right, I guess I'm not going to be able to look at it. <laughs> we're going to have to we're going to have to wait. Uh, we're going to have to wait. Um So, oh yeah, not sure if they work or not. Yeah, I mean, it looks like I need to wait at least. Uh, so let's, we're just going to have to jump back into uh, our questions. So share screen, do that, boop, but a boop. Kind of hate how this how this sets it up sometimes. Um, yeah, I need to. I think that's good. That's fine. That's fine. There we go. There we go. There we go. Save, update, layout. Okay. <laughs> Back to the question. So we're going to look at the top for the year. This year. This year. And then, huh. There we go. Okay. Okay. We're back in business. So top don't know if this is a question. All right. Just thought this would be interesting to share. Here's how my ethnicity estimates have changed over time as ancestry updates or admixtures. So, okay. So we've got three separate updates and, uh, estimate early 2022. So we have Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Germanic, Europe, typical Northwestern European. So 44, 32, 11, 8, 3, 2. And then here we can see 59, 13. Wow. So Sweden and Denmark went way up. Norway went down. England and Northwestern Europe went up a lot. Ireland went up a lot. Scotland went down a bit. Now we also have Wales and Germanic Europe went down a, a lot. Then to the next one, Sweden, Denmark stayed pretty similar. Norway went up a bit. Ireland 
stayed the same. Germanic Europe went back up. Wales went up a bit. Scotland stayed the same. And then England and Northwestern Europe is gone. All right. Yeah. East England, Northwestern Europe gone. And then DNA communities pretty much. Let's see. Central Southern Sweden, Vastergochland, Faltaping. I'm sure I'm terrible at that. So those are still there. Then Denmark, Jutland, Zeeland, Funen, Lollands, Falster, West and South Jutland. So the the Southern Island. Well, yeah, is it the Southern Islands? I think of uh, of of Denmark that the, these areas are. I know where Falster Island is because I'm working on a video about Falster Island. Hint, hint, Drew Durnell video coming up. Uh, West and South Jutland. So the the communities stayed pretty similar for Sweden and Denmark, but then they added early Connecticut, New York settlers, and Southern Sweden. So early Connecticut, New York settlers, this person very likely has a good amount of colonial ancestry um, in Connecticut, New York. I've, I, I have, in my experience, people that are getting that are usually, yeah, uh, the, the, it's, it's pretty confident. I guess you could say the precision would often be high from what I understand. <laughs> so my tree based ancestry is as follows three fully Swedish great grandparents, one great grandparent from Swedish Pomerania, now Northern Germany, which is really funny because the video that I'm doing on, on Drew Jernil. I don't know if it was necessarily Pomerania, but um, no, it wasn't Pomerania. It was, De it was, it was something else in Denmark. So, but it was Germany just uh, uh, taking Denmark. But yeah, okay. Two fully Danish great-grandparents, one fully Irish great-grandparent, one great-grandparent with early American immigrant Quaker roots. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing that really stands out most of all Typical Northwestern European. Granted, this is a mixture of Northwestern European. So they've got Swedish great grandparents, uh, sort of Swedish <laughs> German great grandparent, Danish great grandparents, Irish, and then the early American immigrant and Quaker roots, which probably trace back to a lot of Northwestern European areas. Um, so, yeah, very, very cool. Very cool. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Not something I wanted out there. Uh, let's see. Go. <laughs> I just need to go copy that. Uh, one of those comments that I left. I'll go in here. Oh, wow. They, <laughs> they already saw. They, I wonder if they're in the chat. If you're in the chat, say hello. If, uh, yeah, if I, if I'm answering your question from Reddit, definitely, definitely pop in, say hello. Um, all right, let's go back this year. And, and I didn't really answer a question. So reviewed comment. Ah, whoops, a daisy. Reviewed. Apply. All right. Let's check chat. Check chat. Um, all right. All right. Let's see. Genome link results are based off of uploaded raw data. How wrong could they be reading it? Well, I don't know if it's only uh, uploaded data that they're using to base off of the results. Um, you know, the, the certain readings they were giving would be things that I would think would require that. So like the thing that was saying connection to hungry or whatever, um, granted someone did say that family tree DNA does read a, uh, the Magyar group, which is Hungarian, which I did not really realize. Um, but that's part of the problem is if genome link isn't releasing a white paper, we really don't know what they're basing it off of. We don't know how confident we can be in their readings. Without the white paper, we just take them at their word, basically. And, you know, for me, as someone who's seen a lot of these tests, and especially with how crazy the admixtures can be, 
if someone's not releasing a white paper to me, I think that's, that's a little bit questionable. Um, especially if that's kind of like the big, big selling point they're going for. Uh, so yeah. Um, let's see. All right, let's jump back to questions. So I'm Chinese Indonesian, and I've been told that I'm 100% Chinese all my life before taking DNA tests. All right, I think what I want to do, actually, I know I'm going to kind of go through these, but I feel like we've just been doing ethnicity admixture after ethnicity admixture after ethnicity admixture. So we're going to go for questions for review and hopefully get some stuff that's not ethnicity. So... Is this DNA segment from, oh, are we still in, yeah, we're still in top this year. Is it going by? All right, I guess so. Is this DNA segment from a common ancestor? Hello, Jared. I have a DNA match that shares with me only one considerable segment of 40 centimorgans long. The other segments are under 10 centimorgans and I filtered them out. Would you say that I can be confident that such a long segment comes from a relative recent common ancestor or can be a pileup region segment so long? Thanks so very much. Um, Alexandra, which is that the Alexandra uh, Cruz who's often in our, our chat? Uh, if it is, say, say, say it. Uh, but uh, let's see. Um, okay. Is that OP? No. I'm interested to know how far back a 40 centimorgan segment could be. The shared centimorgan project at DNA Painter says that it could be eighth cousin, but not fifth cousin three times removed. Wondering if that's just an issue with a lack of data for such distant cousins. Um, how many SNPs does the segment have and which chromosome? The segment size is exactly 39.5 and using 15,660. Okay, so let's answer some a lot of questions in here, not just from OP. So starting with this one, how far back could a 40 center 40 centimorgan segment go? And honestly, it could go far, far back. With the randomness of recombination, it's possible that you could have a segment that gets inherited generation after generation after generation. And you know, you could inherit that 40 centimorgan segment without any change to it from your parents, and they got it from their grandparents, you know, and so far back. And it's just it's just random. Um, there's a, there's a term a lot of people will call, uh, they call it a sticky segment, um, which I know that there's a lot of genetic genealogists who really hate that term because it kind of, it gives the wrong idea about it. It's not like that segment, you know, that segment is, Ooh, it's common and it's sticky and it just sticks with each generation. It's just, it's just random. It's just an, a, a matter of randomness. Um, so it's, it's kind of like how a lot of genetic genealogists really hate the terminology mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosomal Adam, because it gives a really wrong interpretation of what those actually mean, which I know, you know, one of the things that I really hate is all the, the things I always get telling me, oh, well, the Eve gene, the Eve gene. And really what it is, is a misunderstanding of mitochondrial Eve. Um, you know, it's people act like the Eve gene is this specific gene when no, it's, we're talking about the haplogroup that everybody in the world descends from, not just specific people. Anyway, uh, so when it comes to that 40 centimorgan segment could go really far back as for the shared centimorgan project tool, a DNA painter, it is basing that off of real world data. So you are correct in wondering if that is an issue of lack of data and that could very well be it is that they just have more people that have been able to test and say that they're eighth cousins than fifth cousins, three times removed. Um, and even more, it, depending on the si sample size, and especially once you get that far out, I think you're going to be dealing with a lot of craziness, especially people coming from endogamous ancestry that don't realize it, uh, people that have weird things going on where maybe, you know, this person is an eighth cousin of them, but they're also related in a few other ways that are maybe a bit more closer, or they're just related in so many ways that it adds up to look like they're related closer, which is kind of partly part of endogamy. Um, but that, that's kind of what's going on there. So the, the simple answer for this part is, yeah, it could be a lack of, of data. Um, but more than anything, it's really just the fact that they're just so far out. Um, so yeah. So now to the main thing of that, they have this DNA match with a considerable 40 centimorgan length segment, but nothing else is over 10 centimorgans in length. 
And how confident can you be in that? And I mean, a 40 cents Morgan length segment, it, you can have high, high confidence in. Granted, in terms of pileup regions, I think you need to look into that um, because for a lot of pileup regions, they kind of know the specific area of uh, where you can often find those regions. Uh, not always. I think they vary. Um, but, you know, there, there, there are ways to kind of look into that. But with a filtering out of 10 cent to Morgan segments, um, you know, even if you're from an endogamous population, I mean, that's kind of a strong filter, um, you know, unless you're coming from like a Pacific Islander population with your, where the endogamy is just so crazy. Uh, so that's another factor is if you do come from Pacific Islander population group, that may be a big reason uh, why. And then the confidence would be lower. But if you're not coming from that and if you're even if you are coming from an endogamous population that, you know, Puerto Rican, Jewish, uh, French Canadian, things like that, where it's, you know, you can tell the endogamy is there, but it's not crazy strong as opposed to, you know, uh, people from like Cajun and Creole ancestry in, in Louisiana and around the, you know, I think Louisiana, Mississippi, you know, all those sorts of areas where the, you have those population groups, um, they have much stronger endogamy and then Pacific Islanders, it's even stronger. So when you have really strong, maybe, but like, I'd be very curious to see if you did an eight cent Morgan, uh, filter instead of 10 cent Morgans, how many segments would you get? Because if, especially if you're, if you do that and then you end up getting like, you know, a couple more added in, I think that, you know, that that's giving a bit more confidence depending on that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think I'd really have to look at it. You do say segment three, um, you don't say exactly where, but we can see, let's see, pile up regions, chromosome three. Let's see if there's, um, oh, <laughs> let's look at the Family History Fanatics website. Because, uh, yeah, I will say, you know, one of the things for, uh, one of the things for a lot of tutorial videos and stuff, I used to try to do those. And then after a while, I was like, you know what, with Family History Fanatic or Family, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, the Family History Fanatics. Why does their logo say Family Fanatics History? That's kind of funny. Uh, but Family History Fanatics, Genealogy TV, Amy Johnson Crow, uh, Genealogy Gems, a uh, lot of different, a lot of different genealogy YouTubers that do a lot of really good um, tutorial-like content. So that's kind of why I go more the narrative style, and then the reactions. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely check out uh, their their website, look into pile up regions. Um, I think that you can find. Let's see, let, let, let's see what uh, DNA Explained has to say. Good old Roberta Estes. Um, yeah, so the. When it comes to pileup regions, I'd suggest reading reading into it and uh, learning about what the common ones are, and that would be the way to go. Um, so hopefully that answers hopefully that answers that. Uh, uh, let me check chat. Okay. Okay. Ah, Matt, hello. Do you know if the ancestry communities you see on ethnicity estimates are the same as ones on the by parent tab on the matches page? Because I have extra ones on the by parent tab, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense. They have they have the different um, ancestry communities where when you look in the ethnicity page and then if you look in the by parent tab when you're kind of looking at the matches part, um, it has them. I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm wondering if part of it may be in the ethnicity estimate, it's breaking it down based on the fact of, you know, okay, well, if we're just looking at this as a whole, as opposed to the by parent tab, which is basically trying to do phasing, basically saying this DNA is from mom, this DNA is from dad. So I could certainly see where if they then split it up and phase it, they would then possibly get different readings. So what it could be, 
not 100% sure. I'd need to look at white papers to see what the deal is there. But it could be that that's the case and that your communities in the ethnicity estimate are the unfazed communities. And then the ones in the by parent tab are the uh, phased. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, ah, it was, it was Alexandra's question. I thought it might be. So yeah, definitely go check up those pileup regions. So I thought one might be looking at your matches and the other might be looking at reference populations. So when it comes to the ancestry communities, my understanding is that relies mostly on the matches. So it's looking at the matches to see which matches were also getting the similar, uh, readings of of areas but then also looking at what did their family trees say that where they were coming from and then using that information that's when they define a community and then that's when they give it so i don't know the super in depth so this would be something i'd need to look further into um honestly this is one of the reasons too stuff like this of why i decided to leave investigative genetic genealogy because I really do love doing this YouTube stuff. And with investigative genetic genealogy, you're so hyper-focused all the time on very specific research that you don't do a lot of this other stuff. So like I really, over my few years of doing investigative genetic genealogy, I was doing way less research on Ancestry, 23andMe, and my heritage because we weren't allowed to use that for investigative stuff. And then when I was doing genealogy non-investigative, I was just... You know, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't have as much time to learn a lot of the new stuff. And so that was kind of one of those things that I know she already saw it, but I'm just going to put it in here anyway for anyone who wants to see the <laughs> whatever. Um, but yeah, so it's just, you know, it was just a matter of like, I, I want to keep up with everything. And, you know, I was getting really great at doing stuff like Intelligence and Jed Match Pro and stuff that's part of the investigative world. Um, but then I would, you know, see updates from other genealogists about all this other stuff going on that was like, oh my gosh, I could use that to do so much in my own genealogy and others' genealogies and things like that. And so that was kind of one of the things of like, you know, if I do really want to do this, uh, full time and, you know, not just, uh, not just focus on the investigative stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's catch up on the uh, chat real quick. Is Ancestry side view or timber working for endogamous populations? Um, the side view stuff in, in my experience so far has not been useful for the endogamous uh, kits that I, I manage. Um, as for timber, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't noticed any major issues with it of uh, matches that I would expect to get that I'm not getting. Um, but it certainly doesn't seem to be doing anything in terms of cutting out the endogamous matches to a really high degree. It might be cutting out endogamous matches decently, but it's kind of hard to tell too with a lot of, uh, a lot of the endogamous populations that have the roughest time with genealogy and genetic genealogy. It's because not only do they have the endogamy in their DNA, but they also are dealing with bad uh, or, or limited records, lack of records. So like that's a big issue for a lot of people with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry is not only are they dealing with the endogamy with their DNA tests, but on top of that, the records are very difficult to use or there, there's not many records available. They're slowly starting to become available. And so like for my Dutch Jewish ancestry, where we do have the records available, we have family trees going back to the 16th century and earlier for both Ashkenazi and Sephardic Dutch Jews. Um, we can actually see not only how we're related in many ways, but then when we do a DNA test and we're matching all of these different Dutch Jews, a very small amount, so we can look in the trees and see, ah, well, this guy is my, you know, eighth cousin, my ninth cousin, my 10th cousin, my 11th cousin, um, so one of the one of the talks that I give a lot is about Jewish uh, endogamy, how to overcome it, and I talk about this, how you know what endogamy actually is, because a lot of people think it's just a lot of cousins marrying cousins, and it's not always that. That's part of it, but it's also a lot of people being related in multiple ways. And so an example I always use is a, a cousin of mine 
uh, but also a, a very good friend who's the president of the JGS Pittsburgh, uh, Steve Jaron. He and I, I know that we are related through the paper trail, at least four different ways, but that's only through one line of our family because he has Dutch Jewish ancestry through one parent and I have Dutch Jewish ancestry through one parent, but then we're also DNA matching on the other lines so our other parents that's not of Dutch Jewish ancestry, but of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry are matching. So we know four ways we're related through Dutch Jewish ancestry, but then we're also related through non-Dutch Jewish ancestry. And, in, you know, so that's really what what's going on with a lot of that stuff. So, you know, for our Dutch Jewish side, we can see how we're related. Our uh, Ashkenazi or our Dutch Jewish Ashkenazi specifically, but for our Eastern European Ashkenazi, we have no clue, even though we're probably related as either eighth or ninth or 10th or whatever, at least a few times. So through our Dutch lines, where I think if I remember correctly, ninth cousins, 10th cousins once removed, 11th cousins once removed and 12th cousins. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, still wish ancestry had more tools for finding duplicates and errors and such within a tree. Agreed. Uh, hopefully if they do roll out anything, it's not going to be behind more paywalls. Cause I know that's been a big thing. Everyone's really annoyed with how much it seems all of these companies are starting to nickel and dime all the tools that they have. And yeah, it's not fun. Um, so let's see. What do you think about Ancestry's new Pro Tools? I have not used them. I plan to purchase them so I can discuss them, obviously. But it's funny because every time I look at them and see what the tools consist of, and I'm like, I don't want to deal with this right now. It's not worth my time. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Um, so, okay, continue with the question that we, we just answered uh, about the, um, the, the segment. Alexandra comes from an endogamous population and has many matches on both sides that the side view does not identify as such. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, the, dealing with endogamy and having a 40 centimorgan long segment is your longest with all the other segments being under 10 centimorgans does bring the confidence down, but a 40 centimorgan segment is definitely a high confidence segment to have. I mean, 40 centimorgans is big. So that's, Usually when I find a 40 centimorgan segment, that's usually indicative that you're dealing with someone where that segment probably is coming from an actual recent shared ancestor. With endogamy, part of the issue is that because you're related to these people in so many ways, so like this cousin of mine, Steve Jaron, I listed off at least four ways that were related, which those four ways were all super distant, where if we do share DNA, it's probably very small amounts, maybe just one or two segments of, you know, six or seven centimorgans through each way we're related. But if we're related eight different ways, let's say, and each of those relations, we're only getting a seven centimorgan match. It's going to add up all together and then become a 56 centimorgan match. And it's going to look like it's a lot closer than it actually is because our closest relation was like ninth cousins. And so that's the issue with endogamy. And that's one way knowing that to be able to tell when you're dealing with endogamous matches because your endogamous matches are basically a lot of small segments added up. So when you get these really big segments, that's the parts that telling you, okay, well, that big segment that had to come from one shared line. Most likely there's the possibility that, you know, you, you have two different segments that just ended up being um, lined up together that you're sharing from two different lines. But I think that's super, super rare. Um, but that 40 cents Morgan segment indicates that that's not coming from very, very, very distant because it is very difficult for a 40 cents Morgan segment to be passed each generation Un, unrecombined, unchanged, um, because recombination every generation gets 50% of the previous generations. And so usually you'll see those segments go down. Um, okay. Ah, Catherine, another cousin of mine, my maternal grandmother has all Amsterdam based Dutch lines, 3d jigsaw puzzle with no picture. There are so many interconnecting lines going back to the 1650s. Um, a number of Dutch DNA matches with my mom, but not with me. And that's actually very uh, similar to my situation. I have myself tested and my mom tested, who is of the Dutch Jewish ancestry, both Ashkenazi and Sephardi. And when I look at my matches, I do get some of those Dutch Jewish ancestors, 
or not ancestors. I do get some of those cousins that are from the Dutch Jewish lines as well. But then I look at my mom's matches and it's like it quadruples the number of Dutch Jew, uh, Dutch Jewish relatives that she gets. So that definitely shows that while I did inherit some of that Dutch Jewish DNA, I did not get, I probably got less than 50% of the amount that my mom has because she has so many more Dutch Jewish of those Dutch Jewish matches. Um, so speaking, speaking of which actually let's, let's do this. I'm going to show my genie tree. Um, and we'll kind of talk about it. Just show kind of the Dutch, the Dutch lines and just kind of, uh, I guess basically what I'll show is how, uh, how different Dutch Ashkenazi can be from or not just Dutch Ashkenazi, but Dutch Jewish can be from uh, Ashkenazi. So this is my tree. I think many people have probably seen uh, this. This is on Genie. So this right here, this is my father's side, Ashkenazi. Uh, this, this line came from a town called Sokorani. which is in present day Ukraine, but it's completely bordered by Moldova. So you can see Moldova over here and here's Ukraine. And this is the town they were from, but when they left in the 1800s, they considered themselves Romanian Jews. And they were, this area was part of an area known as Bessarabia. Um, then over here, the Rosenberg line, we think might be German, not hundred percent sure. This line over here, they came from a town called Tolchin, which is in uh, Ukraine as well. Uh, not too far from Sokorani on the southern eastern sort of side, but not quite as eastern. I guess it's actually not quite southeastern. Yeah, it is not eastern, western, southwestern. Um, but this is an area called uh, Venezia Oblast, and that's where that line's from. So Eastern European Ashkenazi Jewish and you can see how limited that is. Then we get over here to my mom's line. We have Dutch Sephardi over here. So my Nunes Vaz line, probably one of the lines that I talk about the most. It's a line that I'm currently writing a book about. Um, then we have a lot of other family lines. This was this is where I really cut my teeth in genealogy, was building this tree back in 2009, 2010. Um, I mean, granted, I've been working on it for a long, long time, but you can see how expansive all of this is. So this is all Dutch Sephardi. There's a little bit of Dutch Ashkenazi hidden back there as well. Um, this is my uh, great-grandfather, Morris. He was my last ancestor with all of the Dutch Jewish ancestry. So his father was 100% Dutch Sephardi. His mother was um, one-eighth Sephardic and the rest Ashkenazi. So Jane Moscow, my second great grandmother, she had a great grandmother who was Sephardi, this Rachel Barzilai. So that line back here, that's Sephardi, Dutch Sephardi, but all this other stuff is Dutch Ashkenazi. And so you can see zooming out, this is the Dutch part of the tree. And then over here, we get back into some Ashkenazi. And this line, I actually have to fix. This line was unfortunately one of the downsides of Genie is you get a lot of people going in and editing stuff. And there was a guy that went in and edited a bunch of this stuff. And I thought he was doing work that was right, but I didn't look at it super in depth. And then one of my cousins who did a lot of research on this looked at it and he was like, dude, someone screwed this up bad. So I actually have to go in and fix a lot of stuff. But this line does go back very far uh, because we did a lot of research on it, working with Alex Kukrovsky, getting revision lists, going far back. So very rare thing. This family came from Kiev. But then this family came from, this side came from Odessa. This side came from Kiev. They were part of the Alliance colony. Um, actually, this right here, Bessie Dudas and Yaakov Shlomo Dudas, their grandsons, uh, first cousins of my grandpa Jack, were Jack Mills and Irving Mills, the famous owners of Mills Music, also the publishing company that discovered Dizzy Gillespie, Cab Calloway, uh, Duke Ellington, 
uh, tons of other, well, actually, I don't know if they discovered Dizzy Gillespie, but I'm sure they worked with them, but tons of other super famous uh, jazz musicians. And actually, I've been in touch with uh, Cab Calloway's descendants um, because they also have a very strong interest in the history. And um, yeah, actually, one of my cousins from that side uh, ended up doing a podcast with one of Cab Calloway's great grandsons or grandson. Yeah, grandson, Joshua got Joshua Cabela Langsum and he uh, has been researching their family and I got them to do a, a, a podcast together because my cousin Josh Mills, whose mother is also famous actress Edie Adams, uh, runs a podcast where he interviews the children and grandchildren and descendants of famous Hollywood actors and actresses and musicians and talks about what was life growing up as the kid of famous parents? Because he grew up as the son of a famous actress and his father, Martin Mills, was a famous photographer who also worked in publishing with his dad, Jack. And yeah, so that's my family. But anyway, back to the focus. Over here we have uh, Kishinev is where they're from. Right here we think they're from what would be uh, present-day Grodno, but not sure. And that's basically where it ends. But now looking, we're going to go back a lot further. So let's add 15 generations. So this is really going to show the difference between Eastern European Ashkenazi Jewish families and Dutch Sephardi and Ashkenazi families. So here we have this Ashkenazi Jewish. <laughs> Hopefully this is coming through well, because right now I'm looking and it's like, yeah, it's a little wacky. Uh, but Ashkenazi Jewish. And then over here we have Dutch Sephardi. Actually, you don't know, navigate. So down here, um, can you see that? Oh, yeah. So down here you can see how right, that's the Ashkenazi. And then all, all this Dutch Jewish, super far back. Let that load. Super far back, super far back. And then even, I think this is, Getting into the Ashkenazi side. No, not Ashkenazi quite yet. Oh, my Enriquez Pimentel line. The most recent royal ancestry of mine, the fifth Duke of Benevente, Juan Alonso Pimentel. Um, so a lot of Dutch. Okay, so here we go. So now we're getting into some of the Dutch Ashkenazi ancestry. And you can see how the lines trace back still very far. I mean, most Eastern European Ashkenazi, you're happy if you get back into the 1700s. And here I'm looking consistently at tons of ancestors going back to the 1600s. Now, I will say I have not researched all of these lines. I don't know the validity of all of these lines, but I do know the validity of a good amount of these lines. And I've done a good amount of research on some of them. And there is a lot of um, confidence here, but you can see how far back they go. But then as we move along, you can see as soon where that ends and then boom, now we're back down to the area where it's our Eastern European. So let me check uh, chat. Um, so, oh, okay, let's see. We have... So I think this was the first question. Hi, so this was the person who did the genome link and living DNA. Both were accurate, but just wanted to find out which tribe either Fulani or Tureg I belong to. Also, my four to five cousins are Mali and Algeri. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't I don't think I'd be able to answer that um, about which tribe you belong to. Um, you know, when it comes to African genetic genealogy, I am not that familiar with it so you know like saying you know this indicates you probably come from this tribe or that tribe i don't know if that's even possible or how confident you could be in doing something like that um you know so that'd be something that you might want to find someone that has experience working on african ancestry and finding actual african connection um so you know if you have four to fifth cousins who are mali and algeri um, and that's especially all of their ancestry, not just, you know, one or two lines of it, then that could be indicative that that's where the connections are. But yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I'm not sure I'd be able to answer that. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, a few people went in and screwed up my fifth great grandfather's family and his line is a heavily researched line and sourced. Yeah, and that's the that's the difficult thing about the collaborative websites is that you know, you are dealing with something where, you know, you put all this time and effort into editing it and then somebody goes in, doesn't know what they're doing, screws a bunch of stuff up and then maybe they don't even log in again and now people have to go back and fix it. Um, now, each of the websites do I employ different tactics to help go against that. So like Genie, they're a curator. So like I'm a curator. So you can see up here, Genie curator and Genie curators can lock profiles. They can, you know, they can't, they don't, we don't have like God uh, uh, ability on the, on the website, but we do have a lot of advanced tools that regular users and pro users do not have. And the big thing, including locking stuff so that we can prevent things like that happening. But no matter what, there's the possibility of that happening. And, you know, that's just the, the, that's just the difficulty of any of these types of things where it's a crowdsourced wiki style sort of thing, you know, even Wikipedia deals with that, but then you have the different hierarchies and stuff. And I think in, in my opinion, that's one of the reasons why I'm not the biggest fan of family search, because I feel like of the three websites, family search has the least, um, the least tools to help combat the issues of collaborative trees. Whereas I believe that genie and, and wiki tree, while they go about it in different ways, do have really good ways of kind of combating that. Um, yeah. So, all right. <laughs> I think I've, I've gone through way more than enough on that. So let's get back to the questions. Um, ba, 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 da, 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 ba, 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 ba. All right. Top. Yeah, this year. And okay, so we did ancestry updates. Oh, that's right. We wanted to do questions for review. Uh, let's see. What is this relationship called? Oh, that's it. We answered a question from Necessary Parking earlier. This person's getting lots of questions answered. I know this sounds weird. What is the relationship called between two people who have the same mother but different fathers? However, the twist is the fathers are brothers. Is it like three-quarter siblings? Yes, three-quarter siblings. Or half-siblings plus first cousins. Is there such a name in this relationship? Three-quarter siblings. Um, so they're paternal first cousins and maternal half siblings. Some genealogists like to use three quarter siblings though, which is roughly what the DNA would show something between half siblings and full siblings. Yes. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's really much of anything else to say with this one. Uh, this is a perfect, perfect segue to say that if you didn't catch the most recent reaction I did, it was to uh, Vsauce, Michael from Vsauce uh, talking about what are relationships? Uh, you know, what's a cousin basically? I think maybe that was what the, the, the title was called. What's a cousin. And, uh, I did a reaction to it. And, um, if you haven't seen it yet after the stream, be sure to go and, and check that out, uh, on the reaction channel. So wait, what did I do? Did I just do? Yeah. Reviewed. Okay. So let's check chat. Oh, really? No, chat's not, uh, not so chatty today. Um, I do. I see we've got some people uh, hanging out on Twitch. We've got a good amount on Facebook, a lot of people on YouTube. Um, so just, uh, oh my gosh. Wow. I just realized I did not show you the screen. <laughs> so this is, this is the question I just answered. <laughs> gosh. <laughs> oh wow so i know this sounds weird what's the relationship called between two people who have the same mother but different fathers however the twist is the fathers are brothers so three-quarter siblings so yeah karma gal zeroth cousin still confuses me basically the idea is is this basing the relationship charts off of math not like just you know oh my cousin this basically the idea of a first cousin is that you have one generation between you and your shared ancestor and that other person has one generation between you and your shared ancestor, thus meaning one. Whereas when there's two generations between you and your shared ancestor and two between the other, then then your second cousins. 
Whereas if you have zero generations between you and your relative, meaning your sibling, that's when you're zero cousins because a cousin, that's the idea is on the mathematical formula, but that's basically what it is. Yeah. Um, where's the link to Facebook and Twitch? I found the Twitch, but none of them are in the description. Oh, okay. Here, let me, let me post that then. Um, yeah, for those for those who have Twitch accounts, um, but you're watching elsewhere, if you want to jump into Twitch and comment for a bit, that's gonna that that'll that'll help me out. <laughs> so okay, so I'm gonna post the link for everything. So if you're in your one and not the other, hopefully you'll be able to jump through. So just trying to build up my Twitch, make it so that, you know, diversify, diversify your bonds. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So we answered that one. I can't believe I didn't show that. That's so, so funny. Um, all right. Necessary parking has had too many questions answered today. I'm sorry. So many people would be jealous of them just because they got so many questions answered. Okay. My mother's half first cousin. Hello, this is my mother's DNA match to her second cousin from her father's side. Actually, hold on one second. Ah, oh, much better. Much, much better. Okay. Okay. Hello. This is my mother's side. Let me make that bigger. This is my mother's DNA match to her second cousin from her father's side. Actually, it should be my mother's second cousin. Wait, what? Based on my knowledge, the DNA match should be the granddaughter of my mother's grand uncle. Okay. This is my mother's DNA match to her second cousin from her father's side. Actually, it should be my mother's second. Okay, I, I'm so confused. Based on my knowledge, DNA match should be the granddaughter of my mother's grand uncle. But on my heritage and DNA painter, my mother shares 509 center Morgans, 14 segments with her second cousin. What I also notice is that the segments are large and evenly distributed on the chromosomes. I also compared the segments at DNA painter in the library with some half first cousin examples and is looking very similar. What is your opinion or view on that? Could it be possible that my great grandmother had an affair with her husband's brother? Then this match would definitely be right in size. Okay. I feel like they meant to say something else here because they say to her second cousin, but it should be a second cousin. Okay, so this should be a second cousin. And they're getting 509 cent to Morgan shared across 14 segments. Um, but, okay, so... What was the number? 509. So we're looking at 509. And... Second cousin, it's certainly on the high, high end of the second cousin, but it's falling within the histogram and falling within the, um, oh gosh, I can't even think of the word for this. Uh, the, 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 what is it? The standard deviation? I don't know. They, <laughs> if anyone's statistical, they can tell me what, uh, what the actual terminology is, but basically it's like falling right on the edge of where that confidence kind of starts to drop dramatically. So could it be a half first cousin? And so, okay. DMA should be my granddaughter, should be the granddaughter of my mother's grand uncle. So, the mother's grand uncle. What I also know is okay. So no, could it be possible that my great grandmother had an affair with her husband's brother? 
See, I feel like I'd need to see a tree to completely understand um, what they're thinking in terms of the, the family tree here. Because the part that's throwing me off is, could it be possible that my great-grandmother had an affair with her husband's brother? Because we're not told the granduncle is the sibling of who. So where's the grandmother fit? Where's the, there's a lot of assumed things. So let's see. Um, okay. Who, it's no Huckleberry. So her grandfather was my great grandfather's brother. So the mom's, Let's see. My mother's father's side. So the mom's paternal grandfather. So that gives us a bit more to work. Oh, so she's asking basically. So instead of the kid. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But one thing I am noticing that will be worthwhile saying is people are showing seg cm this is a website by Britt nicholson uh very cool guy i actually had a drink with him when i was at roots tech last year um and basically he came up with this website where the idea is is that when you look at matches like when we're looking at these matches we're only looking at the shared centimorgans but the thing is is that the number of segments may vary because it's been consistently found that when you're looking at the recombination rates of females versus males, the DNA recombines more for females than in males. So what they found, and I think even um, Andy Lee from Family History Fanatics has a long series all about this, which I highly re recommend watching because I think he, he was kind of leading that study into this, um, unless maybe there were multiple studies going on at the same time. But basically what they found is that by looking at not just the total centimorgans, but the number of segments, you can then get an idea of what line it's actually through. So they're saying here, 67% probability of being a half first cousin group. So 509 across 14, and it's on my heritage. So here you can see uh, in, in understanding it, there's two different ones. So you have a 23 and me one, and then you have one for ancestry, family treaty and my heritage. So we're going to stick with this and 509 across 14. Just hit submit. And by the way, here's the, uh, the URL for everybody watching. And oh, wow, we've got a lot of people, a lot of people on Twitch. Hello, hello. Thank you for, for oh, no, that's mine. Thank you for jumping in. Um, Awesome. Yeah. And if you, Hey, if you want to be really active with those chats on Twitch, I'll really, really love it. Uh, <laughs> and Oh yeah. Okay. We actually ju just to do a couple of shout outs. Um, can I, Oh wait, no, I can't. Oh wait. I don't know what I'm doing on Twitch. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing on Twitch. Um, all right, we'll do that. But yeah. Hey, Hey everybody. on Twitch. <laughs> Unfit. All right. Uh, yeah. Un okay. I think I'm getting the hang of it. But yeah. So we're going to do submit. And here we go. So now instead of just getting this breakdown, so we had 509. So we have this breakdown where it's telling us what we, what we probably could fall into. All of these are possible, but there's a higher probability with, with different ones. So, um, Looking in here, we can see the breakdown is very different. Uh, not only are we getting the breakdown, okay, half first cousin group, first cousin once removed, but then even more, we get grandparent, grandchild, and it's telling us if that's the case, and we're looking at a paternal, paternal grandparent, grandchild, that's the higher probability than if it's a maternal, maternal, or a paternal, maternal, or maternal, paternal. Hopefully, hopefully I'm not messing everybody up. But basically the big idea with this is not only does it give you an idea of what relationship distance you may be looking at, but also what specific line of your family may you be looking at. So it's certainly showing half first cousin is the possibility. Now, as to their specific question of could it 
be possible that my great grandmother had an affair with her husband's brother? I mean, I guess that's possible. I think I'd have to kind of draw it out to look at the percentages of all of that. Cause I guess, I guess the idea is, is that instead of it being from a grand uncle, it's actually from a great grandparent. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I'd imagine that I guess it could be other things if it's a, you know, if it's a half first cousin, um, there could be other things going on. Um, yeah. So hopefully that, hopefully that answered the Zach question. Hopefully that answers that question. So we're going to say reviewed. Close that. Let me catch it. Let me check on chat. Check on chat. So. Yeah, I'm trying to learn as much as from you as possible about breaking through these brick walls using DNA. Well, I hope that what I'm saying is helpful. Uh, don't really do Twitch. I leave it to my gamer son. <laughs> totally understand. I feel like Twitch has a much younger audience than YouTube. Um, oh, we got someone in the UK. Would you consider doing a Q&A dedicated to YDNA? Yeah, I guess uh, that might not be a bad idea. If I did that, I'd probably want to have uh, my buddies, uh, Michael Waz and Adam Brown or one or the other, uh, join that chat to be on there because, well, I do know a lot about YDNA. Uh, those two are really knowledgeable beyond my knowledge um they're the people that when i have questions i go to them <laughs> so i would love to have them on that so yeah uh dna painter has a great what what are the odds tool yes the what are the odds tool is wonderful one of the few tutorials that i've done is on dna painter what are the odds so if you've never seen that tutorial it's a bit old though now i mean it's got to be at least three years old that i did that tutorial so probably a little out of date but can still be helpful in just understanding the basics of it um okay so where are we at in time all right uh doing just under two hours so yeah i'll uh i'll do i'll do a few more questions do a few more questions um let's see wow necessary parking has so many i just noticed that I mean, I guess I've already answered two today, and then there's two more. I mean, we've got another one. Is necessary parking here? Say if whoever's necessary parking, if you're here, say hello. Um, but we'll do following fickles. Reading old handwriting on the back of photographs, postcards. Hi everyone. I was wondering. Ah, so we have some transcriptions. So not stuff I'll be able to help with, but ah, I think this is Gina helping out. Gina's a, a long time watcher and uh, very active. Um, so she gave uh, some stuff. So yeah, one of the, one of the fun parts of genealogy being able to look through this stuff. So look at that photo though. Look at that sword. That's such a cool sword. Let's Look at that sword. That dude definitely saw some things. All right. <laughs> so, I mean, Gina, Gina kind of got, I think she got it all. I don't know. We'll just, we'll just go ahead and say reviewed. Oh, and I forgot. I need to add in the, uh, Little whatchamacallit parts. Da, 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 da. Okay, it's not liking me right now. It's not liking me. Oh, that's why I have it set on the flare only. Ah, someone, somebody posted while we were, while we're doing this. Okay, let's see. Let's 
So <laughs> do do a little bit of house cleaning and go back in here and put these in. Oh wait, no, we didn't do this one. Oh, now that I said that they're Uh, if anyone wants to help me and go and put it, <laughs> put that in the uh, other ones I did, uh, greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. Um, all right, let me just check up on chat before I jump in because I see we've got a bunch of stuff. Which do you feel is more accurate, genetic communities versus genetic groups? Are they about equal accuracy? Um, now, I guess, I guess the the question that I have is genetic communities versus genetic groups, what are you referring to specifically? Because I know those get thrown around a lot in terms of the, you know, the different DNA sites have specific terms on each site. Like I think genetic communities is what they call it on ancestry, but I can't remember what they call it on other ones. So I don't know if you're asking in terms of like the admixture percentages versus the genetic communities, or are you asking in one site's communities versus one site that I guess maybe calls it genetic groups. Um, so I'll, I'll keep an eye out for that if you uh, can clarify. Um, Matt says, what are your thoughts on me using a matches DNA match list who's given me access to their list to find shared matches under 20 centimorgans? I'm researching my second great grandfather who left Ireland and my largest match I've confirmed who's from the common ancestor. Maybe his father or mother is around 20 centimorgans. So not many shared matches above 20 centimorgans. By this method, I've got over 100 extra ones. Might I be going down blind alleys or is this a necessary risk worth taking? I mean, with 20 centimorgans, it's so small and you're looking at so many different ways. The, the way to do it is if you can somehow cluster these matches. So you've got hundreds of matches apparently around this amount. But if you're doing that, what you need to do is cluster them. So find the matches that, you know, you may have hundreds of them, but can you set them up into, okay, well, these five cluster and these five cluster and these other five cluster, and then identifying the common ancestors amongst those clusters, because then that's when you start to kind of get more into what you're looking for. But you're dealing with something at such a distance that, while you could there, while you could possibly be successful doing it, I think that you're looking at such a very small possibility of success, and that you are looking at a higher possibility of a lot of wasted time with no results. So, not necessarily saying don't do it, but it could be something that maybe there's a better technique that could give you more that's available. But if there is no other technique and this is the best technique, then it may be worthwhile. You might, you might be able to figure it out, but you are certainly, you're, you're at a extremely high difficulty. Oh, I, I just realized my face is being blocked. You're at extremely high difficulty. <laughs> um, so yeah, you've been clustering them, but hard work, been looking at localities, surnames as well. Yeah, localities, surname, any way to cluster. I mean, the best ways to cluster is if you can do, you know, auto cluster or leads method and actually go by the actual DNA. Um, but then even if you can't, then doing surnames, localities, things like that, definitely, definitely helpful. Um, so, okay, let's get into this. Um, oh, I upvoted this one, so let's see. What are the odds of African-Americans having Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry? I don't see any more specific. We do have OP. Um, all right. So let's see what this says. Arnez, it probably originates from the Iberian side here in Brazil. It's also common for people with Portuguese, Spanish ancestry to have some Jewish DNA. In this case, they have Sephardic DNA, but it's often interpreted as Ashkenazi by most genetic calculators. Additionally, many Brazilians have confirmed this heritage through documentation. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not sure how common it is for American people to have Iberian ancestry, probably some kind of old Mexican ancestry. And then, yeah, that's what they thought. So let's see what they've got going on with their percentages. So we've got 72.9% African, 
what site is this? This looks familiar, but it at the same time it doesn't. What site is this? Is this is this family tree DNA? I don't think so. Maybe it is. I don't know. Okay. We have West African, East African, and then general breakdown Africa, 72.9%. So kind of typical African-American reading. Granted, I feel like most African-American readings, I see more African. Um, you know, I know uh, the, the number that people used to say for a long time when I first got into genetic genealogy about 10 years ago, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, it always seemed like the number you heard was 75% African, 25% European for most African-American readings. Then as time went on, it seemed like the 25% went down and went down. And now it seems, I think, more like 10 to 15% or maybe even 10 to 20% is more the typical reading. And then once you kind of get over that, that's when it's a, you get higher European. So here we have European 24.1%. And of that, there's a 9% Ashkenazi Jewish breakdown which is high. And even more specifically, when we take a look at this and see the American, the uh, indigenous American is only 3%, granted it's Central and South American. Um, and then with the Iberian, we have 4.2%. Well, what this person said is true. The thing is, is that these percentages don't really fall into this category as much. For one, you know, the... Portuguese and Spanish ancestry, the Iberian is small, 4.2%. The indigenous American is small, 3%. And even added together, assuming that that comes from some sort of known South American or Brazilian or some sort of ancestry like that, it's less than the Ashkenazi Jewish. And with 9% reading, that's a significant reading. 9% Ashkenazi Jewish is significant reading especially with the fact that the other readings that people kind of would say, oh, well, it makes sense because you have these. It's not really making as much sense that, oh, well, the Ashkenazi Jewish must be coming from this Siberian indigenous American connection, whatever. Uh, because if it is, then that means that whatever that connection is, the large majority of that ancestry is more of the Jewish side than of the Iberian indigenous American side. Granted, recombination is random and it could just be that maybe you inherited a lot of the Jewish and not as much as the other. But with my experience with numbers, um, not knowing which site this is, let me check chat. If anyone knows which one this is, let me know. Um, oh, I do see W tree asked before uh, their question about genetic communities versus genetic groups, ancestry DNA versus my heritage DNA. Personally, I have not seen a difference in one being more confident than the other, but it's also, it hasn't been something I've been hyper-focused on looking at. So something I might consider uh, looking into further, but yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, if anyone knows which site this is, I, I, I'm not 100% sure. But either way, with this, what I would start looking into with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry now 9%, I would start looking into great grandparents, second great grandparent level. So let me go back to see what they said here. Uh, when I saw people from mid and South America on YouTube showing their DNA results was odd to me. The highest I saw was no more than 3%, which is the big thing. When you usually get those small percentages of Ashkenazi Jewish, that's where you say more of what this person is saying of, yeah, probably is coming from that distant Sephardic Jewish ancestry that then was forced is kind of a weird way to say it if you know the history of the inquisition but you know forced in a sense to then become catholic and so they integrated into that society and because of that a lot of people with iberian ancestry have ashkenazi jewish readings but it's not nine percent it's two percent three percent maybe even four or five percent um but then okay the highest i saw is three percent so my jewish ancestors definitely didn't come from an old mexican dna especially since my jewish dna is higher than my Native American and Spanish ancestors, which, yeah, we saw. So with this, I mean, the way that I would go about this, number one, the question is, does OP know all of their great-grandparents, all eight? Because at 9% reading, that would be the place that I would jump to is we're looking at either a great-grandparent or a second great-grandparent, but I would want to look at a great-grandparent first 
just to see, you know, that's closer. So we can go with, okay, do they have all eight great grandparents identified? And if they do, we look at each one, see, look at their parents and see what we can find from their ancestry. And with 9%, I mean, you're confidently looking at a great grandparent, second great grandparent, or at least a third great grandparent, assuming that this is all coming from one recent ancestor. Um, now, there is a possibility that maybe you have a Jewish ancestor on your mom's side and a Jewish ancestor on your dad's side. And because of that, it's adding up a bit more. But still, even if that's the case, you're still probably looking at something that may be genealogically findable. Possibly difficult, depending on what type of Af or what type of ancestry you have. I say African American because you do say African American, so I assume African American in the sense of not African or Afro Caribbean or you know African from Central American or, or South American, but African American in the sense of from the United States, um, because depending on where that. African ancestries from, in a sense, you know, where from Africa to the, the Americas, where that landed will change how you kind of interpret things. But with 90% Ashkenazi Jewish, I'm, I'm thinking that this is probably leaning more towards coming from a recent common ancestor knowing African American ancestry in the US. Um, and so yeah, great grandparent, second great grandparent. And let's see, they had other photos too. Oh yeah, they, they had the yeah, that. So um, and the thing that I would even say even more too is when you look at that Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, depending on what you find, that could actually end up making more sense and explaining possibly some of the English or even Iberian uh, that you're getting. Because if you do look at your Jewish ancestry and then maybe you do find, oh, well, I'm getting some, so I actually have Sephardic ancestry, even though it says Ashkenazi, what this person said is correct that it's interpreted as Ashkenazi by most genetic calculators. So they maybe they find they have Dutch Sephardic ancestry. And while it's not necessarily going to explain the Iberian, all of the Iberian could explain why there is that going there part of it. I don't know. So the main, main takeaway here is that this is an admixture that I would say, yes, it's very useful in how it would affect my genealogy research in this person. Very similarly to what I did with Steve Heimler's family tree in um, the YouTuber family tree series episode I did for him. So if anyone's unfamiliar with that one, I'm going to see if I can pull it up and share it with chat. Um, but that um, he had a higher reading. I think it was actually 12%. So like right, right at what you'd expect for a great grandparent. But in that I show how I go from each great grandparent to the other and build it out and build it out and build it out and build it out and try to figure it out. Um, so here's that video. Oh, wait. Okay. There we go. So, all right, let me, uh, I need to do this reviewed. I need to do the other thing, make sure that they <laughs> know where it was answered. And then I'll check up on chat, see where y'all are, how y'all are doing. I think, uh, yeah, we just hit two hours, so I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to go. Apply answered in this live stream. Comments. Okie dokie. Okay, doke. All right. So let's check up on chat. Check on chat. Check on chat. Uh, so Karma says she believes ancestry DNA is more accurate than my heritage DNA. I'm assuming you're talking about the genetic communities question that was asked earlier. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Why is it called recombination? Isn't it the exact opposite? It's a new combination between parents DNA never combined previously. Um, I don't know. I guess, I guess probably in the sense of, you know, your parents DNA was 
a combination of their parents' DNA and then it recombined. So it combined again and then you were, then you inherit it. So like when you look at meiosis, you have your parents' DNA that then it, it doubles and then mixes. So like they have the, if you look at your dad, you know, he has the DNA from his mom, the DNA from his dad, it doubles and then mixes. So it re combined. So I'm, I'm assuming that's why, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm assuming that's why. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, through lands is frustrating DNA matches, but when I research the branch, I find an error. They never correct or respond. Yeah. It's a major issue with through lines. And I, I can't remember if this was something ancestry said they were going to roll out or if it was something that someone suggested they should do. But I remember hearing about people talking that there's there of some way with through lines of indicating when it doesn't match up. So basically, you know, through line says, we think this is a line, but they may think it's a line because another user has wrong information in their tree. And so their my understanding is there may be a way to go into your through lines and basically put a comment or click a button that basically says this is wrong or this doesn't match up or something. But I don't know if that's in line or just something someone suggested. It certainly would be very worthwhile. Um, let's see. Okay. Also been trying to sort out Irish DNA. My dad and aunt's grandparents, after a couple of years, still having problems identifying descendants of sibling or cousins of my great-great-grandfather. And unfortunately, that just happens. I have the same issue with my uh, uh, a paternal great-grandmother, my great-grandmother Fanny, who I, I know so little about. I don't know what her true maiden name is. I don't know uh, who her parents' names are. There was a rumor that she had a brother who was living in the U.S., um, we, we do have multiple possible maiden names for her documentation shows multiple maiden names and we have pictures of her, but she died really young. And, um, I've been trying to get some of my cousins to do mitochondrial DNA testing, uh, with the matching, uh, you know, family tree DNA style to see if maybe that'll pull something out. But I mean, this is the unfortunate thing is sometimes it's just not there. And then one day you'll get a match that all of a sudden breaks it all open. And then next thing you know, you'll see all these other matches that you've been looking at for years. And now you can all of a sudden place them because of the new match. So, you know, hopefully that'll happen sooner than later. Um, okay, let's see. You are welcome. Definitely, definitely, uh, definitely watch afterwards. Um, Fourth or fifth grade grandparent. Okay, that was an answer to someone. Hey, just joined. How's it going? Well, welcome, Callum. It's going well. Uh, Hopefully you uh, enjoy <laughs> the last few minutes. I think we're going to be ending a little soon, um, but you'll be able to go back and watch. Uh, my through lines are a mess. So many incorrect trees. Yeah. With through lines, it can get really, really, really messy. So, you know, for those who go into through lines and think, Oh wow, this is telling me all this stuff. This must be true. It's not always true. You do have to confirm it. Um, through lines doesn't recognize my sister as a match under mom, but does grandpa, but not grandma. No sense. What it probably has to do with that is it has to do with the fact that, uh, or it has to do with what family trees they have connected to their, uh, DNA. So if they don't have any family tree connected to their DNA profile and ancestry, it will not show up in, in through lines. So even when you look through your match list, even if they have a family tree, but it's not connected, which when you look through your match list, it'll show as unlisted. Um, it won't show up in through lines. It has to be connected. So that's probably why that's happening. And the other thing too is, is they do have it connected to any trees, but those trees don't have the right information or don't have any information, then that's not going to be of any help. A uh, great example is one of the guests of, of mine on the YouTuber Family Tree series. I don't remember who... Uh, it was, I, I think it might've been Drew, but uh, one of them had a half sibling where the half sibling had a family tree built out um, and then they had them connected to it. And then the guest had a family tree, but their tree was just really basic or something. And basically they were half siblings, but it showed in through lines that they were getting their half siblings, paternal and maternal lines, even though they were only related through, I think the maternal. So it was like, their through lines were completely wrong and I had to go in and edit their tree and change up stuff. And it took a day or two before through lines finally corrected. 
Um, so yeah, through lines. So through lines helpful, but you know, yeah, just have to just have to be careful. Um, oh, two of my posts are on screen. Which ones are you? Don't are you uh, are you necessary parking? Is that you, Callum? Because because uh, we've actually done uh, we answered two from necessary parking, and I've been I've been running across so many posts from necessary parking. So I wonder if that's you. Yes, that's you. Okay, that's so funny because I literally I was like, okay, we've already answered too many from you. You you're, you've been lucky. Today's been your stream, and you just jumped in. So you'll have to go back and rewatch the stream because I answered uh, two questions of yours, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't, I think, yeah, I'm, it's over two hours. So uh, I don't think I'm going to answer any, <laughs> any more questions. I'm a little questioned out um, with that. Uh, but I'll still keep chatting with chat uh, for those who are here. So by the way, uh, Matt behind me, not sure if anyone guessed today. Um, it kind of has some words that are large enough that give it away where it is. Um, but the one hint I'll give is this is a 1940 map. So, um, yeah, so wasn't guessed today. <laughs> May have to use it for the next the next one and oh what was my tooth <laughs> fun with green screen so well thank you so much again to everybody that came in today always appreciate it uh next week uh gonna figure out exactly what i'm gonna do for the live stream on the main channel i think i'm gonna do another family tree building the main question will be do I continue building Taylor Swift's family tree or do I switch gears and do another one? Um, I was considering doing a stream, maybe building a tree for like Baruch Spinoza or someone with Dutch Jewish ancestry, just because that's my specialty. And I would absolutely love to really show off building a tree using uh, Dutch Jewish records um, and, and just Dutch records in general. Uh, but yeah, so it, uh, Otherwise, if you have suggestions, celebrities you'd love to see me build their trees, let me know. Definitely love to do it. But that's going to be it for today. Thank you all so much. Be sure to like, subscribe, follow, do all of the fun stuff if you have not done it yet. And if you uh, aren't following me on Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, Instagram, you know, I'm on all of this stuff. So find me and follow me. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful, happy new year. And uh, I will see you all in 2024. I'm out.